In the not-so-distant future, a desperate scientist strikes a deal with the government to disperse 2 million tons of calcium carbonate into the atmosphere in the hopes of saving the Earth from overheating. It's the year 2059. On television, Madam President of the United States admits to having thought long and hard, prayed and consulted with organizations and leaders of potential coalitions before deciding to sign a treaty extending the moratorium on geoengineering and anything that could artificially influence the climate. After all, technology is not the only thing that can change nature. Rowan Chopin switches off the TV in frustration. He has worked so hard to get geoengineering recognized and allowed to fix the planet's climate. To make matters worse, it's obvious that his father, Jonathan Chopin, a scientist with influence over the president, talked her into it. The annoyed young man leaves home despite his father's attempts to talk to him and resolve the issue peacefully. Later, Jonathan and his wife are on a yacht, but his mood is down as his son still hasn't reached out to him, even though it's Father's Day. Meanwhile, Rowan arrives at an airplane hangar where his stepmother, Gita, is preparing to present a new plane. She asks him to talk to his father and even quotes Hemingway, The world is a fine place and worth fighting for. But Rowan remains steadfast. His father doesn't understand him and he'll be very angry if he finds out that Rowan is helping Gita. And at this time, Jonathan contacts a detective agency and asks them to check his ex-wife's accounts to find out exactly what she was buying. But the employee refuses to do so because he now works in the United States and can request his service from the FBI. The only thing she can tell him is that Rowan is in Djibouti, where Gita is. Jonathan's wife tries to convince him to let the situation go, while Gita addresses the audience as the director and founder of the new Sky program. She announces the test flight of the first carbon-neutral unmanned transport, which is capable of staying in the air continuously. She introduces her assistant, Rowan, and the woman admits that the plane is named after him because he worked with the plane's interface and took it to a whole new level. She thanks the investors, and to show how confident she is in the plane's reliability, she will be participating in a test flight herself. They loaded the plane with the maximum amount of cargo it can carry, 250 tons, and she is ready to begin the experiment. Jonathan is informed about the presentation and Gita and Rowan's role in the planned flight. He doesn't understand what's going on and starts to contemplate it. But Rowan is confident that his father already knows everything and will do everything to sabotage their plans. Gita laughs, remembering that during their honeymoon, Jonathan, the greatest mind of humanity, couldn't fix a broken toilet in the hotel. So she bought him a reference book called How to Fix Everything in the World, where people confess to being like gods. And today, they will fix the whole world. Rowan reports on the readiness of other planes that will drop cargo simultaneously with her and leaves the plane, hoping that he won't be caught before that. The plane takes off to the applause of the spectators, while Rowan changes the flight passwords and sets a new course, causing confusion for the flight commander. But Gita explains that she has decided to visit the homeland, India. Meanwhile, Jonathan reviews the recording of Gita's performance and questions why she decided to embark on an unmanned flight. He recalls Rowan's scientific project from middle school, where the boy explored the consequences of a massive volcanic eruption that sent billions of ash particles into the air, resulting in cooler temperatures on Earth. Some scientists then began experimenting to create a similar effect, and Gita was one of them. She believed it would help solve the problem of global warming. The dispatcher is informed of the plane's altitude change, and the concerned man contacts Gita because it is unacceptable for a commercial airliner. This means that the military will become interested in the plane and the secrecy will be lost. At the same time, Jonathan is interested in the performance of chemical companies, and listening to a report, he notices a drone flying in. However, it is just a food delivery. He contacts his assistant again, asking her to find out if the chemical companies have sold New Sky the chemicals they listed, as many of them can be used in acts of global terrorism. He must decide whether to contact the authorities. Meanwhile, the watch officer warns Gita that Washington is interested in the flights, and she asks to speak directly to Rowan and issues orders, as the authorities will soon figure it out and contact her father. An FBI agent arrives at Jonathan's house, whom he called when he realized what Gita was plotting. Meanwhile, the president muses that one day there will be a mechanism that safely extracts carbon from the air, but for now there are trees on Earth. She thanks people for planting the millions tree, when she's informed of a group of private jets flying eastward, suddenly changing course and not responding to calls. At the same time, Rowan smashes his phone and leaves the building, while Jonathan tries to convince the FBI officer that Gita has planned an international attack. He worked on geoengineering in the past and invested considerable effort and resources to put it into practice. But in this science, there is no room for changes, there is only one chance. 
Jonathan asks for help in reaching the president who at that moment is listening to Gita's demands to drop millions of tons of calcium carbonate into the atmosphere, which would lower the Earth's temperature that is steadily rising. If the U.S. recognizes geoengineering, it will land without incident to solve the problem peacefully. The president declares a general gathering when Rowan contacts Gita from a secret command center, and Jonathan explains to the president and the government the consequences of spraying chemicals into the atmosphere. If this happens, the Earth will experience cooling, floods, and as a result, crop failure. And he's convinced of Gita's determination. However, this procedure will have to be performed every two years because if it works, people will not give up the use of dirty fuels. At that moment, Gita contacts them. Ten million people are dying from heat while the government sits in air-conditioned offices and she intends to solve the problem for them. The president is trying to persuade Gita to ground the planes, but the woman is adamant. Jonathan joins the conversation and suggests that the main problem is people treating the planet like a buffet table. He urges Gita to stop as she doesn't know the consequences of these emissions on the oceans and the atmosphere. The woman becomes angry because today's emissions and tons of plastic in the oceans are much more dangerous for the planet. And it's simply impossible to rewire human brains. Rowan contacts them, reminding the father of his words about the end of the earth. All deadlines have passed and the father is doing nothing to solve the problem. That's why he takes action. Gita says that she sees the coast of India when the communication is cut off. It turns out that the communication was blocked for security reasons. Jonathan is asked to leave the room since he doesn't have the clearance level. The man protests, asking to speak to his ex-wife and son, but the security officer is unyielding. The scientist asks for paper and pencil since he intends to make calculations and remains in the adjacent room while the situation is being discussed in the neighboring room. Ten planes carrying calcium carbonate threaten unknown climate changes. Snowstorms and floods could shake the global order, and inaction will look like complicity. The president expresses hope that the emissions will help change the climate when she is invited to the phone. At this time, a group of soldiers find a bunker that is transmitting messages from Rowan. But it turns out to be only his hologram, and the guy himself is sitting in front of a computer in a gaming club where no one pays attention to him. He warns Gita about the possibility of their communication being jammed, and she tells him about the plane that is flying parallel to her course. The plane is ordering Gita to land. Rowan suggests that Gita should do so, as they have already shown their determination. But the woman asks to be allowed to act according to their plan, even if she's shut down. Meanwhile, the president discusses the situation with the rulers of other countries and hopes to solve this problem unofficially. And then she tells his secretary that her desk is named after the ship Resolute, abandoned in the Arctic, where now nothing reminds of the ice caps that covered it. Meanwhile, Jonathan is calculating and asks for the opportunity to speak with the president, and Gita tells Rowan about her conversation with the government. And suddenly, the accompanying military planes turn around and fly away. The woman rejoices, it seems that everything worked out. But the communication is interrupted and there is an explosion in the sky above Mumbai. People watch the fiery ball above the sea while the president is puzzled because she does not understand who gave the order to destroy the planes. The Air Force commander denies involvement. Anyone could have destroyed the plane. Excited, Jonathan reports the results of his calculations. Gita is definitely trying to distract their attention from something else. Apparently, there are other planes. He is informed about the explosion and the fact that other planes dropped cargo. Rowan comes on the line and reminds his father of a quote about peace. He is ready to see this through, despite his father's pleas. The communication is interrupted while the guy is commanding the drones to drop cargo all over the world. The president watches it from the window while Jonathan returns home and confesses to his wife that he doesn't know what will happen next. It's a very difficult moral dilemma. Does one person have the right to decide the fate of billions, even if they are convinced of their righteousness?